Good afternoon. I'm on the red dot. How exciting is that? I'm really delighted to be here. And like you, I'm loving listening to the other speakers and their inspirational ideas. Many of them, of course, as you'd expect, about technology and the amazing things that it is going to deliver for our world, whether that's in education, energy, space, health. Thrilling times ahead. When I look ahead, though, when I imagine what's next, I'm afraid. I'm frightened that in our excitement about technology, we're forgetting how to listen to each other and how to talk. Human-to-human, -human, face face-to-face communication is my passion. It's also my trade, my craft, my skill, my job. Uh, I've worked in front of a, a camera, a microphone, and an audience for 25 years. I'm a voiceover artist, as you just heard, and a presenter, and I work on live events. In fact, when I was a continuity announcer on BBC television, they're the people who pop up in between the programmes and, and tell you what's coming next, and I did that for eight years. There was a shift at the weekends, uh, earlys on BBC One and BBC Two, when we used to put Open University programmes on air, and I mean literally put cassettes into machines and press play. Uh, that was uh, exhilarating and terrifying, as you can imagine, in equal measure. For 20 years, I've been training other people, helping them to become confident and skillful communicators, and that is why I believe it is our most fundamental life skill. If you think about it, every day there are numerous instances when things will go your way or not, depending on how well you communicate. You may have come here on the train and discovered that you had the wrong ticket. You might go out to a restaurant tonight and the chips are cold. You might want to avoid an argument with your teenage daughter about the length of her skirt. You might want to buy a new sofa and get a good price. You might have to deliver difficult feedback to a colleague or a student. In each instance, everything hinges on good communication. Now, I'm not actually here to talk about the cold chips. I'm here because I've noticed something is happening in my training room. I'm seeing that people are arriving with two really big problems. The first one is they're afraid of small talk. They're worried about those conversations that meander where they're not in control. They feel safer crafting something in writing in their own time, on their own terms. And so they're avoiding these situations. They're choosing not to communicate with clients and colleagues. And what's happening before meetings these days? Are we all sitting around doing chit-chat about the rugby or my dad's hip operation? We're not, are we? We're all on our phones. The second area is dealing with challenge. Those moments when we're thrown onto the back foot by an unexpected question, when our views, opinions, our judgment, our knowledge is queried. Or maybe it's simply that somebody has expressed an alternative point of view. Now, these issues are proving really problematic. They're holding back people's careers. They're damaging their relationships inside and outside of work. And they're making a lot of people unhappy. Now, it's not just in my training room, is it? All around us, we see how the way people communicate is changing. Look at what happened in the House of Commons at the end of September. Public and private debate is becoming ever more personal, it's becoming angry, and it's becoming ugly. World leaders vilifying their enemies on Twitter. And we've all seen this, haven't we? Oh, lovely, happy family out for dinner. Oh, actually, no, they're all on their phones. Toddlers addicted to technology. Apparently, 34% of preschool children have their own device. 
What do you think of Uber's new offering? You can now select in advance that you don't want to speak to the driver. TED Talks are getting shorter. And if you don't like the views of the speaker, well, you can silence them. You can de-platform them. Now, what worries me about these digital forms of communication, and social media in particular, is they are training us to communicate, to respond, possibly even to think very quickly, very briefly, very simplistically. There's no room for nuance, is there, or subtlety. So instead of unpicking the ideas of somebody that we disagree with, let's say the science that Greta Thunberg is citing, instead of that, far easier to go straight to name calling. Bad man, nasty woman, mentally ill. And have you noticed how many superlatives we're all using all the time these days, the exaggerated language Everything is disgusting, vile, evil, outrageous. Do you know what? Nobody these days ever seems to be a bit miffed or slightly surprised. And it can't be a coincidence, can it, that concentration spans are getting ever shorter. Have you seen the Microsoft research that concludes that human beings concentrate now for eight seconds? before we're distracted, and that's down from 12 seconds in 2000. We are turning into goldfish. <laughs> it feels, doesn't it, that communication is being downgraded, marginalized. So what, I hear you cry from the cheap seats. We're evolving, as we always have. People freaked out when the first telephones came in. What does it matter? Here's why. It matters to the lawyer who gets partnership because she learns how to give a killer presentation. It matters to the university lecturer who gets a professorship because he can talk about his achievements better in interviews. My favorite though, the 10 year old girl I met at her school when I was running a workshop there. We call them communication skills for life. And one of the techniques that we look at there is how to communicate better with adults. It's the beginning of small talk. This little girl told me that she tried this technique on her granny. And she said, do you know what? We ended up having quite a long conversation. And I've never done that before. And it was really interesting. This isn't just about communication. This is about relationships. And I think that is worth fighting for, each of us, to improve our own communication skills, anytime, wherever we're starting from. Because actually, do you know what? It's just like a sport. So we learn some tools and techniques and we put them into practice and then it becomes second nature. And for the record, confidence is not a mystical force field. It's a muscle that we can grow. Let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean by these, these practical tools and techniques. The thing people seem to most fear about small talk is starting a conversation with a stranger. Yes, some nodding heads. Try this. Try as your launch pad something that you and they are experiencing together in that moment, something you're sharing. So it might be the view from the meeting room, it might be the art on the wall, it might be the speaker you've just heard, the event you're attending, the brownies that you're about to tuck into, even though you know you shouldn't, and of course we've always got the weather. And it can sometimes feel, can't it, a little bit intrusive to ask a question of a stranger. So try this instead, simply make a comment. Wow. That's quite a view, isn't it? When we look at dealing with challenge, the key thing we need to focus on there is what's going on in our head at the moment when the challenge is made. If we can shift our mindset from resenting the challenge and the challenger and wanting it 
to be over, wanting to shut it down as quickly as possible, if we can shift that to respecting their entitlement to make the challenge or to have that alternative viewpoint, everything will flow differently. Now, this is not about you suddenly agreeing with them, changing your mind or caving in. This is simply about respecting their entitlement to have a different perspective on the world. Sheryl Sandberg put it beautifully in Lean In. She said, there's their point of view, their truth. And there's my point of view, my truth. Rarely is there one absolute truth. Therefore, people who think they speak the truth are very silencing of others. Albert Camus said it rather nicely as well. The need to be right is the sign of a vulgar mind. So respect, very important. What leads very nicely on from respect is listening. And we mean actually listening, not waiting to speak. Have we all experienced the difference between those two? It is one of our key communication tools. We have, after all, two ears and one mouth, and we should be using them in that ratio. Buddha, if your mouth is open, you're not learning. So we can all learn to be better communicators. But how can we support the people around us? What can we as parents, educators, leaders, people do? Well, we parents, hmm, we can put our phones away every now and again. We can fully concentrate on our children. We can actually listen to them without distraction. We can liberate them from their technology every now and again. Wish us luck with that one. We can turn off that digital noise that follows them around. We can let them experience quiet and solitude and explore their own imagination and creativity. We know that this is good for their mental health. All of us can also engender a healthy atmosphere around disagreement and conflict. We can normalize it, whether that's in the back of the car, around the dinner table, or in this lecture theater. We can set the tone for what feels like it's become some sort of battleground for uh, offense and intolerance, this you-can't-say-that culture. Leaders, well, we can follow in the footsteps of Pep Guardiola, the Man City Manager. He's achieved amazing things on the football pitch by creating an extraordinary <coughs> atmosphere within the team. And I've read about two things that he's done. One is he encourages them to play cards on the team bus rather than all being in their own little worlds on their headphones. And the second thing is there are compulsory team breakfasts and lunches. What's he doing there? Easy peasy. Getting them to listen and talk to each other. I do believe there was also some business on the football pitch. Let me end with a warning, a cry for help, a plea to all of you and to you. Join my campaign. Of course, we're going to embrace all the amazing things technology will deliver for us. But please, let's not lose this fundamental life skill. It's within our power to create a world in which people are listening to each other, talking to each other, understanding each other's differences. Best of all, though, a world in which little girls and little boys are chatting to their grandparents. Thank you.